Okay, class, as we move on to chapter six, and now we're gonna do the bone tissue and then move on to the axial skeleton. So this will be fun. Let's start with some fun facts. Um, babies are born with 300 bones, but by adulthood, the number is reduced to 206. Great quiz question. The reason for this is that many of the bones of children are composed of smaller component bones that are not yet fused like those in the skull. This makes it easier for the baby to pass through the birth canal, so the bones harden and fuse as the children grow, and that can vary from child to child. Uh, it can be five, it can be six, it just depends. Um, we are about one centimeter taller in the morning than the evening, so we talked about this uh, early on. Okay, as you know, I have two boys. They're very curious. The uh, little one loves uh, dinosaurs. But here's a nice little picture of a child looking at bones. Uh, bone is living tissue. Remember, it's connective tissue. Unlike the bones of a fossil made inert by a process of mineralization, a child's bones will continue to grow and develop while contributing to the support and function of other body systems. So tissues and organs of the skeletal system. Well, what is bone composed of, or the skeletal system? Composed of bone, cartilage, and ligaments. As you know, cartilage is embryonic forerunner for most bones and covers many joint surfaces. We talked about that, the difference between hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fibrocartilage in the last uh, um, lecture. And then you remember that ligaments hold bone to bone, and then tendons attach muscle to bone. But what about bone itself? Uh, let's uh, dive into bones. So the function of your skeleton, whether it be the axial or the appendicular, its function is to support. Function is for movement, but we need muscles for movement. Uh, you got to protect those delicate organs. Uh, that's why the rib cage is there to protect the heart, the lungs, liver, gallbladder, um, blood formation in the marrow. Uh, we need electrolyte balance, especially of calcium and phosphate. And we talked about the hazards of drinking Coke and Diet Coke because the phosphorus in the soda will leach the calcium from your bones. So remember, there has to be that balance. So if you have too much of one thing, then the calcium has to leave in order for it to balance. So that's the, the, the detriment to eating or drinking soda for a long period of time. There has to be acid-base balance, so the skeleton helps with that. And, of course, detoxification, and we'll talk uh, more about that as the lecture goes on. Um, <clears throat> bones act as levers when muscles span a joint and contract, and we'll talk about uh, first, second, and third class levers when we get into the muscular system, but just remember that bones currently will act as levers, and there is a difference between first, second, and third class levers. Um, the bones protect the brain. Uh, that's very important. The cranium completely surrounds and protects the brain from non-traumatic injury. What is osteology? That's the study of bone. Remember, logi means study. Osteo means bone. So put it together, study of bone. Bone is connective tissue with a hard matrix. Mineralization, calcification, process of hardening. Uh, other tissues that are present in bone, well, you have blood, you have bone marrow, you have cartilage that surrounds it, you have adipose tissue, you have nervous tissue, and you have fibrous connective tissue. That's all present in bone or around it. General features of bones, well, there's different kinds of shapes, as you know. We have flat, which are thin but often curved, so a perfect example would be the ribs. We have long, rigid levers for movement, such as the humerus and the femur. We have short that glide within the joints, for example, the carpals of the wrist, um, the foot. And then you have irregular shape, complex shape uh, bones, such as the hyoid bone and the vertebrae. So here's a little example of a flat bone, which is sternum. Here's an example of an irregular bone, which is the vertebrae. Here's some example of short bones, which are in the foot. Here's a sesamoid bone, which is the patella. Uh, no comments from the peanut gallery about why it's called patella. <laughs> and then the long bone, which is the humerus and the femur. Now, I'm sure you have uh, uh, seen someone or yourself or a family member uh, have broken a bone before. And we'll talk about uh, the different classifications of fractures in a little bit. But here's an arm brace. An orthopedist will sometimes prescribe the brace of an arm that reinforces the underlying bone structure. 
that's being used for support. So you'll see someone walking around with that. So it's just giving support because the bone itself, it can't do what it's designed to do. Some general features of bones. Uh, let's start with the long bones. Um, they're con there's compact and spongy bone tissues, and we'll talk about the difference between a compact and spongy bone. There's two epiphyses, which are the heads, at the ends of the diaphyses, which is the shaft. You have a marrow, which is a medullary cavity. And then you have the epiphyseal line, which is remnants of the growth plate while the child or adolescent is growing we call that the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate and so really that's where you grow from and if you have a fracture in the growth plate then sometimes it's forced to shut down prematurely and that can really affect your height or the length of the limb and we'll talk more about fractures as we go on there's a periosteum covering there's a nutrient forema there's an endiosteum lining, and then of course there's articular cartilage uh, um, to smooth the joints. Okay. Now, here's some fun facts. The hardest bone in the human body is your jawbone. So the next time someone should suggest you take it on the chin, you might be well advised to take their advice as the jawbone is one of the most durable and hardest to break bones in the body. Unless you're Kanye West, right? Remember Kanye West? He made that whole uh, popular song, Through the Wire, uh, because he had, he had a severe uh, car accident where he actually fractured his mandible. So he was wired shut, and that's why the song was called Through the Wire. The tooth is the only part of the human body that can't repair itself. So if you ever chipped a tooth, you know just how sadly this one is. The outer layer of the tooth is enamel, which is not living tissue. So since it's not alive, it can't repair itself, leaving your dentist to do the work instead. So if you see these advertisements where you, they're selling toothpaste where, oh, it can repair enamel, um, it technically is false advertising because enamel itself is not living tissue and your enamel cannot repair itself. So be careful with such claims that say we can repair your enamel. So here's the anatomy of the long bone. Again, at the ends, you have articular cartilage which is like tread on a tire. Okay, you don't want to lose too much of that. When you lose all the articular cartilage, that's when people say, oh, I'm bone on bone. Yeah, because there's no more articular cartilage protecting it. So then it does become literally bone on bone. Here's red bone marrow. Here's an epiphyseal line. So that's technically the growth plate. There's the marrow cavity, yellow bone marrow. Some of you like to eat uh, uh, bone marrow from... Uh, chicken or uh, bones. Uh, I never tried it, but some people say it's delicious. There's the periosteum cover. And then you have a nutrient forema, which will deliver nutrients to the bone. Here's compact bone on the outer surface, and you have spongy bone on the inside. So here's a good true-false question. Spongy bone is deeper to compact bone, or compact bone is superficial to spongy bone. And again, here's the epiphyseal line. So as you're growing, what happens is you actually grow from here. So the difference between the diaphysis and the epiphyses is what causes you to grow. When this obviously shuts, then growth no longer takes place. Compact bone, um, here's a good uh, uh, terminology. The basic unit of compact bone is called the osteon. And you have concentric lamellae. And then you have a central canal, which is called the Haversian canal. And then you have perforating canals, which is also sometimes known as Volkmann's canals, which deliver nutrients to the bones. And you have circumferential lamellae. All these are designed to deliver nutrients and blood supply to the bone. Now remember, blood supply of all the connective tissue probably has the best blood supply. So that's why if you fracture something in four to six weeks, mostly six weeks, but a fracture can heal unless you have a severe fracture, which might need some screws and plates. And we'll talk about the different fractures. But here's the periosteum, and then here's the endosteum. So here's the periosteum, which is a fibrous layer. Okay, and then you have a cellular layer. And then you have an endosteum. So the periosteum forms the outer surface of the bone, and the endosteum lines the medullary cavity. So those are two different layers of the bone itself. And then you have osteocytes, 
and lacunae are little uh, indentations or little uh, uh, openings where these osteocytes fit into. Okay. Here's another anatomy. Here's a good close-up. Here's compact bone, and then here's spongy bone. So you can see the difference between compact bone and spongy bone. Compact bone is pretty resilient. Spongy bone can give a little bit, so it absorbs the shock and the stress a little bit better than compact bone. Some bone features. The surface features of bones depend on their function, location, attachment of ligaments and tendons, or the penetration of blood vessels and nerves. And as we do this axial skeleton, appendicular skeleton, of course, we'll learn all the parts of the bones. Okay, so we'll learn all the different organization of the bones. We'll learn what the head, tuberosities mean, fossas mean. So this is just an introduction, but we'll learn all that. What a crest is, what a fossa is. Okay, a canal versus an opening versus a foramen. So now when we talk about bone cells itself, so the first one we want to definitely talk about are called osteogenic cells. And osteogenic cells are actually stem cells. Stem cells found in the endosteum, the inner layer of the periosteum, and within the central canals. So osteogenic cells can multiply continually and give rise to osteoblasts. Okay, so again, osteogenic are stem cells, and we love stem cells because they can form more cells. So here's a good, uh, um, you know, make sure you know that, okay, osteogenic cells give rise to osteoblasts. So what do osteoblasts do? They're the bone-forming cells that synthesize the organic matter of the matrix and help to mineralize your bone. So they usually line up in rows in the endosteum and inner layer of the periosteum and kind of resemble like a cuboidal epithelium on the bone. So unfortunately, osteoblasts are non-mitotic, right? So they don't go through mitosis. So the only source of new osteoblasts is osteogenic cells. So it's very important to understand that, that stem cells, which are the osteogenic cells, are the only ones that can make new osteoblasts. Osteoblasts themselves cannot go through mitosis and make more of themselves, okay? So stress and fractures stimulate accelerated mitosis of those cells and therefore rapid rise in the number of osteoblasts. So it's kind of like if you don't use it, you lose it. So as far as osteoporosis is concerned, you want to walk and you want to put stress on your bones. Therefore, it triggers the osteogenic cells, which are the stem cells, to make more osteoblasts. Okay, Osteocytes themselves are called mature bone cells and they're form of osteoblasts that have become trapped in the matrix they deposit. They usually live in these little tiny little cavities called lacunae um, and they usually they're connected to each other by a slender little channel called caniculi. So each of these little osteocytes have delicate cytoplasmic processes that reach into the caniculi to meet the processes of the neighboring osteocytes. So Again, they all kind of work together. So then knowing the difference between the lacunae, the caniculi that connects everybody. Now, osteocytes themselves have multiple functions. So some reabsorb the bone matrix and others deposit it. So basically, they, they maintain that host homeostatic maintenance. Remember, the whole body always has to go through homeostatic balance. Uh, um, even more importantly, though, they're strain sensors, right? So they, they, they trigger strain or they measure strain. So when a load is applied to the bone, it produces a flow in the extracellular fluid in the, of the leucine and caniculi. So osteocytes have little antennas, a solitary cilium, that senses this fluid flu, and this stimulates the osteocytes to secrete biochemical signals that regulate bone remodeling. So this is the importance of always walking and stressing your bones, weightlifting, putting, using resistance exercises. This is why it's very important. If you just, and this is why astronauts, they lose bone density because they don't have the stress being put on their osteocytes to stimulate bone growth. Now, osteoclasts, these are the ones we don't like. They're the bone dissolving macrophages. So they develop from the same bone marrow stem cells that give rise to blood cells. Uh, several stem cells fuse with each other to form an osteoclast, 
Thus, osteoclasts are usually large and typically have about three to four nuclei, but sometimes up to 50. Um, the side of the osteoclast facing the bone has a ruffled border, usually. But again, we don't, we don't like these osteoclasts because they're bone-dissolving macrophages. Uh, um, the lysosomes of osteoclasts then release enzymes and digest organic com components. Uh, this dissolving the bone tissue is also called osteolysis. So remember we talked about uh, lysosomes in cells, and so some certain cells have more lysosomes. Certain cells don't have as many. So it's very important to understand the difference between an osteogenic stem cell versus an osteoblast versus an osteocyte and osteoclast. They're great, great quiz questions. Definitely see that on the quiz. All right, so again, here we go. Here's the osteocyte, osteoblast, osteogenic cells, and osteoclasts. Uh, it all stems from the osteogenic. So four types of cells are found within bone tissue. Osteogenic cells are undifferentiated and develop into osteoblasts. When osteoblasts get trapped within the calcified matrix, their structure and function changes, and they become osteocytes. And then osteoclasts develop from monocytes and macrophages and differ in appearance. <laughs> So we love osteogenic cells. Uh, osteoblasts are good. They form the Born matrix, but they're, they don't go through mitosis. So we rely on these stem cells to make more osteoblasts. We don't like osteoclasts because they reabsorb bone, but sometimes if we have too many, then they're okay. So every, every one of these help contribute to a homeostatic balance. The bone matrix itself is uh, one-third organic, which is collagen and large protein carbohydrate complexes, um, two-thirds inorganic. So that's 85% hydrooxyapatite, which is crystallized calcium phosphate and salt, 10% calcium carbonate, and 5% other inorganic minerals. So you can see that most of your bone is calcium. That's why calcium, calcium, calcium is uh, so important in your diet. Now spongy bone, we'll talk about the difference between compact bone and spongy bone in just a little bit here. So compact bone, in the histologic study of compact bone, usually uses slices. Uh, uh, so when you're looking at uh, compact bone, right, you're going to see pretty much concentric lamellae. You're going to see central osteoonic uh, can canals and then the osteon itself was the basic unit so you also see per perforating so canals all, like i was telling you it's also called volkman's canals so they contain blood vessels and nerves now the difference between spongy bone is spongy bone has spicules which have rods and spines of the bone they have trabeculae which are thin plates of bones they usually have this porous uh, Swiss cheese uh, kind of appearance. Um, space is filled with bone marrow and usually it's lightweight but strong. Uh, so we need spongy bone. We also need compact bone. So a mix of the two gives uh, a perfect combination. Okay, Bone marrow itself is a general term for the soft material that occupies the marrow. So here's spongy bone again and then bone marrow which is soft tissue located in medullary cavities. Well, you have two types of marrow, which is red marrow, which is the myeloid tissue. So you have homeopathic tissue, blood-forming tissue. Both red and white blood cells are made here, so that's very important. And then you have yellow marrow, which is what you usually like to eat, and that's mainly fat. Okay, so here's a slice of the head of the femur showing red and yellow marrows. The head of the femur contains both yellow and red. Yellow meaning fat, and red where all the blood cells are. Yellow marrow stores fat. And if you're hungry... We can uh, usually have, uh, yes, these bone marrow recipes. That's what you like to eat. That's the fat in between. Some people say it's delicious. I've never tried it. But again, where where can you find this location of marrow in adults? Uh, red marrow is found in the skull, vertebrae, sternum, ribs, parts of the pelvic girdle, and proximal heads of humerus and femur. And if you want to eat the yellow marrow, not of humans, obviously, silly, of chickens or cows, they're found in the long limbs like femurs and humerus. Okay.